There is a bar in New York that I don't think anyone but me can see. Well, they don't acknowledge it, at least. It's a small place tucked in between the Panda Express and the Blairy Stone on 8th Avenue, across the street from Madison Square Garden. Sometimes I don't even notice it, to be honest. If I'm not out looking for it, it'll slip right under my radar. Sometimes I feel like I'm looking right at it, and it won't be there. I've always been an observant person. It comes as a perk of being quiet and introverted, so I'd been chalking it up to that, or the simple fact that it wasn't a popular place as to why no one noticed it. But I started to notice something odd. Despite the fact that no one ever went in or out of it, there was always a decent crowd. For the last few days, I've been getting lunch at the cafe across the street and watching it, just to make sure that nobody went in, and sure enough, no one did. So today, I'm going to figure out what's going on. I mean, I'm not exactly the adventurous type, but I do like to have answers. It's probably nothing. Maybe the owner is just an asshole and nobody wants to acknowledge the bar. Or maybe it's an invite-only deal. Hell, I just might be crazy. But whatever the reason, I'm going to find it. And I'll post whatever happens here. For some backstory, my name is Charles Kelly. I work at a marketing agency around the corner from the pub, so I walk past it every day, and I've always been very observant. I just tend to notice things around me. I'm not sure when I started noticing it exactly, but I know I've never saw it open. I just started noticing it. It's a very little building. It's run down with a very dark color tone. It wasn't very decorated at all, just a sign with one golden tooth on it hanging above the door. There are only two windows, one on either side of the door, but they were heavily tinted. I could see through, but it wasn't easy without drawing stairs, so I didn't do it that often. Like I said though, Whenever I did, it was busy. The windows were too dark to see anything more than dark shapes moving around, though. Today, I think I'm going to ask a few of my co-workers if they know anything about it, and it'll probably end there. I guess I'll end up posting all this anyway, just in case anyone else out there is wondering what's up with the Golden Tooth Bar on 8th Avenue. Alright, it's a little weird. No one had heard of it. Not even Jordan, the asshole, who had a thing to say about every restaurant in town. All 26,000 of them. Not the Golden Tooth, though. We looked in the phone book for a number to call, but there was nothing. And by that time, our boss wanted us to get back to work. There was nothing, not a trace of this place anywhere. On my way home, I walked past the bar again. I don't know, something about it just weirds me out. I feel like it's right there, then I walk to the end of the block and turn around, and I can't see it. It's a trick of the light or something, right? I don't know, there's not many avenues for me to go down besides from walking right in, but I'll keep this updated if anything happens. February 15th. Today was a Saturday, so I didn't walk past the bar, but I mean, it's weird, right? No one at my work had ever heard of a bar that's not even a block away from it. That's definitely strange, but it's definitely not worrying. I'm not much of a social butterfly, I didn't exactly have plans getting in the way, so my day was free to pursue this as much as I wanted. I wasn't really sure where to start, but I didn't want to go straight to the bar. I don't think I'm ready for that quite yet, so I decided to do some research at the library. There wasn't much to my trip because, once again, there was not a trace of the bar anywhere. Not the gold tooth, not the golden tooth, not even the golden teeth. 
I'm running out of options aside from just walking right in. I don't know. That just might be what I'll do. What's the worst that can happen, right? It's an exclusive club and a big bouncer throws me out? No, I suppose the worst that could happen would be that I'm crazy and I bumped into a brick wall. I'll do a bit more digging. The post isn't long right now, so I'll hold off until I can add more to it. That'll probably be the pattern here. I'm not going to upload a paragraph at a time, so you'll probably see multiple days covered in one post. The strangest thing just happened. I left the library and decided to go to one of the only places left that might have a chance of knowing about this place my local bar. However, before I had gotten 10 steps from the library, I had picked up a tail. As I mentioned before, I'm hyper observant, so I noticed it pretty quickly. He was dressed in normal street clothes, no fancy black suit, no dark sunglasses, but I could tell he wasn't comfortable in those clothes. He was undercover. At least, that's the first conclusion I jumped to. He may have been a creep, but he definitely was following me. I took four lefts, and he stayed with me, but quickly dropped back after that. He must have realized I knew he was following me, and either abandoned ship or gotten a whole lot more careful. I decided to forego my mission at the bar and head straight home. And now that I am home, I'm starting to think that option where I'm a crazy person investigating a brick wall may not be so far from the truth. Secret agents tailing me? Come on, I'm just on edge. I'll try and take my mind off it for the weekend. By Monday, maybe I'll have slept on it enough to be ready to go in. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't think about it for the weekend. But I'm not crazy. There's this cafe across the street from my apartment. And ever since I got home last night, there's been a man sitting in one of the chairs staring up at my apartment window. I don't know what he wants from me or how he knows which apartment I live in, but he's barely moved. He gets up every once in a while, goes into the cafe, and comes out with a coffee. He probably goes to the bathroom while he's in there. That's what I've deduced, but he hasn't slept, hasn't talked to anyone, he's simply been watching and waiting. It's been over 24 hours now and he's still there, I mean the cafe isn't even open, it's almost 2 in the morning but he's still there. When the place closed, I saw a waiter approach him, but he just waved him off and continued sitting there. It's a public bench. The police can't tell him to leave, can they? Even if they could, I sound crazy enough just listening to my own thoughts. I have no idea how crazy this would sound to the police. God, talk about crazy. I've slept a combination of three hours this weekend. I have work tomorrow. If he was going to kill me, he would have done it by now. I'm going to bed. I am at work now, but it was, of course, a feat getting there. I slept past my alarm this morning because, of course, the lack of sleep. And as I was dressing, I checked out the window to see if that man was still there, and he was. Realizing I had no choice but to walk past him, it was a stressful process, getting ready the rest of the way. It probably made me even more late. However, when I walked out on the street, I stopped. The man was gone. There was nobody in any of the chairs, in fact. It was the first time I went out to see the guy up close, and he wasn't even there. Am I crazy? I don't know. Anyway, I saw the bar again this morning. I looked closer, and there was a lot of strange shapes moving around. It was dark, but they were moving. Living things that didn't quite look human. That's definitely one in the crazy column. I mean, what am I going to do at this point? I'm going in after work. I'm going to do it. This is it. I'm either crazy, or I'm not. 
Alright, I didn't go in. I'm back at my house now. But things have just gotten so much worse. As soon as I got out of work, I noticed a man following me. I'm not sure if it's the same man from the cafe, but I have a feeling it was. Then I noticed another guy across the street on the bench. He was looking at me over a newspaper. There was a woman drinking a cup of coffee, but was there really coffee in there? I suddenly felt a strange sensation on my wrist, and I looked down at my watch. I took it off, and it looked normal. I knew that dark patch was always there, but what if it wasn't? What if it was a bug? I ripped it off and stuffed it in the nearest trash can, just in case. A woman with earpods glanced up at me in confusion from the other side of the bin. She could have been one of them, too. I backed away from her, then broke into a run towards my house. I didn't even glance at the golden tooth, I just needed to get home. That's where I am now. I locked the door, closed the blinds, and then checked my room for anything that could have been changed. Everything was exactly where I left it, though. Okay, now that I just typed all that out. I think this whole ordeal is driving me crazy. I think, and that's the worst part, because as crazy as all this sounds, there's a little part of me that says I'm right. Maybe all the others were an overreaction, but I don't know. There's just something about the cafe guy. I'm going to call in sick for work tomorrow. I've decided that much. I don't know what I'm going to do. But what I do know is that eventually my curiosity will get the better of my paranoia. It always does. This time, though, I don't know what the results could be. February 18th. Someone knocked on my door this morning, moments after I would have left my apartment for work. It was a short affair. Three sharp knocks, then a beat. Then they left. No attempts to jiggle the doorknob. No follow-up knock. I was looking out the window at the time, making sure no one was watching me. And I jumped at the sudden noise, knocking over a potted plant I kept on the windowsill. I held my breath for a few moments, but there was no more noises. Then I scrambled over to the door and looked through the peephole, but there was no one to be seen. I immediately thought that I must have imagined the knocks. It certainly wouldn't be the biggest hallucination I'd experienced. At least, I hope so. You know what? Let's just say all this is real. What is the Golden Tooth? Some kind of secret government organization? I suppose I have no proof that it really is a bar. It just looks like one. It could be a test facility. It could be some kind of surveillance outpost, and now that I've been poking around it, I've been put on some watch list. I could be in danger. What if they are arranging an accident for me? Since then, I've been blocking my windows and staying in the middle of my apartment. This has all happened in the course of, what, four days? I've never had anything like this. I'm not a paranoid guy, so I'm starting to think it may be real, after all. I waited alone in my apartment for almost an hour, pacing nervously before I realized I should probably do something. Call it suicidal, call it rash, an impulsive decision, but I figured if I was going to go down, I might as well figure out what was in this place. After peeking out of the window to see that the cafe man was nowhere to be found, I pulled on a Yankee cap and some sunglasses and slipped out of my apartment. When I got to the base of the building, I took the corner onto 8th Avenue and bumped into a man coming around the corner. I moved to brush past him, but then I recognized him. It was the man that had been following me for the past three days. He didn't seem to be caught off guard, instead, he seemed to wait for my move. For the split second it took for me to decide it, 
I lowered my shoulder and rammed into him, knocking him to the ground and broke out into a sprint towards the gold tooth. As onlookers moved to help the man up, I continued on. When I was halfway there, I glanced over my shoulder to see that he hadn't begun to chase me. The crowd had disappeared, and he was just watching me, staring me down. I didn't wait another moment, knowing that he could have accomplices waiting for me around any corner. I made it safely to the sidewalk in front of the bar, though, and when I had looked back momentarily, the man was gone. I took a deep breath in and barged through the door. The bar went quiet. It was, in fact, a bar, as I had originally guessed, but not a normal bar. There were several tables scattered about, a few booths and the bar, and in those seats sat the strangest derangement of beings I'd ever seen. There were some humans, but other than a bartender and a group in the corner booth, they were all wearing black suits and darkened sunglasses. Quite the formal attire for such a relaxed environment. They were the normal ones, though. There was a wide variety of unearthly creatures sitting and seemingly eating. Creatures that stories were whispered around the campfire about. Creatures that were responsible for the bumps in the night. At the bar, there were several tall, weary creatures with skin so dark I'm not sure black would even describe it. They seemed to take in all the light from around them, making it difficult to see where their forms ended and the background began. Their eyes remained the only blemishes, the pure white specks in the dark void of their head. To their right was a scarecrow like the one you'd see in a cornfield, except as I watched it, it slowly blinked its eyes, then gave me a smile. Next to the scarecrow, there was what looked like a normal man. Well, normal, except for the red eyes, but I could tell there was something off about him. He wasn't human. He was sitting with several smaller creatures that looked straight out of a biblical painting. They couldn't have been more than four feet tall, with little spiked tails waving around and wings jutting from their shoulders. They had gray-green skin and spiked teeth, and they smiled wickedly at me. There were all those and so many more that I saw, but I was brought out of the shocked moment of panic by a voice. You're not supposed to be here. Then there was the click of a pistol, and I could feel the cold metal against my temple. February 18th. I slowly raised my hands and gulped as the gun pressed into my temple. Every eye in the room was on me. You could have heard a pin drop. Then the man holding the gun spoke again. Nobody's used that entrance as long as I've been here. Who are you with? He asked. I wasn't sure how to respond. But before I could say anything, a door in the back opened, and to my utter surprise, the man from the cafe walked through wearing a sharp black suit, identical to the ones the other humans in the bar were wearing. He was buttoning his sleeves as he walked in, and he seemed not to notice the tension in the room at first. Then he glanced around, saw my predicament, and chuckled. Well, everybody, sorry for my timing. I had to do a quick wardrobe check. Don't worry about Mr. Kelly there. I've been tailing him since he discovered us. If he were going to tell the world about us, he already would have done it. Put the gun down, you twat, a British voice said from somewhere behind the man holding me at gunpoint. You're clearly scaring the man. Why'd he come through the front door then, he responded, gesturing with the gun towards the door, which caused a brief scare. No one comes through the front door. Well, let's see what Agent Osborne has to say. Why don't we? 
the British man suggested, and we turned back to face the man who'd been tailing me. He put on a pair of sunglasses matching the outfit of everyone else in a suit, and cleared his throat. This is Mr. Charles Kelly, Osborne introduced me, much to my surprise. He caught wind of our location seemingly by accident a few months back, and ever since then he's been doing his best detective work trying to figure out what our deal is. When I let him on to me, I figured he'd either get scared or give up or risk it all and barge in. That's a risk you were willing to take, a woman asked from the same area as the British man and I realized I no longer had a gun to my head. I relaxed a bit and looked at the group going back and forth with Mr. Osborne. There were five of them, three men and two women. Two of the men were standing, one of them who had just bolstered his gun, and a second who stood in the back. A thin, gangly man with a dark look on his face. Don't worry, I talked with Danny beforehand. Osborne said, nodding to the bartender who handed him a drink. The idea was, if he was willing to come in, he's the kind of person we're looking for. You want to hire him? The woman replied. Off the street? Are you crazy? Tiva, if I weren't crazy, would I be here? Osborne returned. That's besides the point. The point is, he's in. He knows now, and if we turn him out, with no answers, he's either going to keep coming back or tell everyone we don't want to have to kill him. You're going to kill me, I exclaimed, then realized my mistake. No, no, I'm sorry, carry on. Thank you, Osborne nodded curtly. I'm not terribly opposed to the idea, the British man said with a shrug, and his group looked at him in shock. What? We've got the job over in South Dakota. I don't see the harm in taking him along, if only to preserve the prosperity of this establishment. South Dakota, I exclaimed. I can't go to South Dakota. Well, we could always take you out back and put a bullet in you, Osborne mustered. You're in this now, whether you like it or not. I sputtered for a moment and glanced around but there was no help to be found in the eyes of the others. That's when I realized something. I had gone too far, just as I had feared, but it didn't mean I was going to get killed, captured, or tortured. It meant that I would survive as long as I could, that I was truly in. All eyes were on me, human and otherwise. I gulped. They had guns. Their threats were well-founded. I had no choice. I held up my hands and said, Fine, you win. Osborne smiled. Excellent. I do hate killing when it's not necessary. He turned to the rest of the patrons and said, Back to your drinks, everyone. The low hum of conversation returned, and Osborne approached me, putting his arm around my shoulder. Well now that you're part of the team, what do you say we sit down and get to know each other? Sure, I replied, nodding. I was beginning to warm up to this idea, especially when it compared to a bullet in the brain, and I figured I might as well get to know the closest thing I have to a connection here. He gestured to the seat in one of the booth seats and sat opposite of me. I glanced around, taking a good look at the interior for the first time. It was very nostalgic, with a rustic feel to it. Oak was predominantly featured as a material, and it was lit by candlelight. From a few chandeliers and a few wall-mounted candles, the bar was the opposite end from where I'd come in, and there seemed to be an area cleared out in front of the bar, no tables or anything. To my left of the bar, there was a normal looking door with no windows, so I couldn't tell what was on the other side. But to the right, there was a door marked kitchen. Above the bar, in the center of the room, was a sign similar to the one outside, with the image of a golden tooth. 
except on it read, established in 1959. All in all, it was a very atmospheric place, large enough to fit a decent-sized crowd, but small enough for it to feel cozy. And if not for the appearance of dozens of strange creatures, it would have passed for one hell of a normal bar. So, do they have anything to drink here? I began the conversation tentatively. I mean, normal stuff, or is it just... I gestured out the creatures at the other tables, unnatural drinks. You keep talking like that, you're gonna get yourself in quite a bit of trouble, he warned. But yes, they do serve drinks you'd find at an outside restaurant. So what is this place, I asked abruptly as he called the waiter over. Why can't anyone else see it? What are all these creatures? Are you with the government or something? I'll go over it briefly now, but I am a busy man. I've just spent the past three days following you, he pointed out. I'll have time to explain everything if you survive the South Dakota job. Is there a reason to believe I won't survive the job, I hurriedly asked as the waiter arrived. What is the job anyway? Come on, let's order, he replied. I haven't had a meal that wasn't from a dreadful cafe across the street from your place in two days. I'm dying for a well-cooked meal. Hey, I like that place, I muttered, but he already turned to address the waiter. Yes, I'll have the bun bo Hu and the coke, please, he said as I raised my eyebrows. What's that, some sort of supernatural delicacy, I asked intrigued. It's actually a Vietnamese beef noodle soup, Osborne said pointedly. The chef's got a knack for it. It's delicious. I chuckled slightly embarrassed and ordered the same. Then I turned back to Osborne. All right, explain this all to me, will you? Who are you? I'm Agent Russell Osborne. I work for the Supernatural Protection Agency, where I've worked for going on 11 years, he said. It's a fairly self-explanatory agency, as far as logistics go. So I'd say it's my turn for a question. You're taking this incredibly, almost suspiciously well. What's the deal with that? Am I suspicious? I quickly asked, eyes widening. I didn't mean to do that, I promise. I'm not going to tell anyone. It's just like you said, I'd rather be in than dead. I'm not... Alright, alright, it was just a question. You're not on trial, Osborne replied, holding up his hands in a mocking surrender. I was just curious because you don't strike me as a very brave person, but with that reasoning, I suppose it makes sense. I'm not a very brave person, I said indignantly. I'm no Bond, but I wouldn't say not very brave. Oh, but I would, he told me matter-of-factly. Alright then, what else do you want to know? My bruised ego forgot in the face of foreboding knowledge. I pondered what to ask carefully. What? Why are all these things here? And why doesn't the public know about them? I'll answer those in reverse, he began. These are supernatural creatures. Their origin is unknown to us, or known but unexplainable. Some pose a danger to the public, some don't. The public cannot know about either because of their nature. Let's use the aliens in the room, for example. If the public knew of confirmed extraterrestrial life, they would be pressuring the government for funding for space programs, for establishing intercelestial communication, for pushing out into the universe. As you might guess, there are many problems with that. Politically speaking, there would be mountains of red tape to cut through, jurisdictions and policies to avoid. It would be a nightmare, and it is much simpler to do it this way. The other, more important problem is that we don't know everything. These are creatures more powerful than any of us combined. They are creatures we don't know about. And if the public knew of the existence of some of them, they would seek out the others. 
we have no idea what could happen, so for now, it cannot be made public. As for why they're here, in this bar, they're non-hostile, as you can imagine. It's fairly difficult to establish a social life when you're, say, an eight-foot-tall pile of gelatinous fluid, or when you're literally the devil himself. So this place, both for creatures to relax and enjoy themselves, and for those who know of their existence to speak freely. I paused for a moment, then let out a long, slow exhale. Whoa, I don't really know what to say. That's quite a bit to take in. It is, so let's not dwell on it. You'll have plenty of time to do that the next time you hear an odd sound in your apartment. So let's get to know each other, he suggested as the food arrived. And then the conversation turned much more lighthearted after that. We talked for just under half an hour as we ate. But as he mentioned, he did have some pressing matters. He also told me that the entrance I came through wasn't ever used. It was just there to throw off anyone who somehow saw the bar's exterior. And that the next time I came, I should come in through the back exit of a store around the block. I was going to follow him out, but the British man called me over to their booth. Wait a minute, lad, come speak with us, he said, waving me towards them. We're going in on this together. We owe you at least a briefing. Yeah, I'd appreciate that, I nodded, sliding into the booth. Well, we're heading out on Friday. We can arrange travel for you, and we'll arrive on location early Saturday morning. We'll have someone send the details to your apartment. From the airport in South Dakota, we'll make about an hour-long drive to the site. We'll spend as long as it takes to get the job done. Shouldn't be more than a day or two. Then we'll have you back by sometime Monday morning. Might have to tell your boss you'll be a bit late, but that's provided you survive the course. That's exactly what Osborne said. What do you mean, if I survive, I asked. Is it very likely that I won't? Very likely, he repeated with a chuckle, then looked around at the group, who also laughed. The last rookie I saw go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Wendigo is funerals next Wednesday, and we're marching into a den of them. A Wendigo, a den of them, he died, I sputtered in surprise. What do you mean, like the Native American this? Myths, the man who'd held me at gunpoint previously chuckled. They're about as mythical as Charles Manson. Sure, you've heard the stories, but just because they're stories doesn't make them any less true. That doesn't make any sense, you muppet. The British man shook his head. To be honest, you might just have delayed the inevitable. You're not choosing a life, you're just betraying your odds. Ever so slightly, but hey, have a seat, I'll introduce you to everyone. I did, and after names were given, we started chatting, and I found out more about the group. The British man was named Edward Richards, the leader and founder of the group. The woman in the back left seat was named Frida. The tall, scary man standing behind them was Lawrence Kaczynskers. The woman sitting across from me was Tava Stewards. And the man who didn't seem to like me very much was Zephin Tolbert. They were a group called the Outsiders, and they were some sort of mercenaries in the supernatural world, taking some of the more dangerous jobs for generally a lot of money. We talked for quite a while. I tried to steer the conversation towards the supernatural, but they weren't too keen on talking about it. Zephin definitely did not like me, though. I'm not sure why, but he's definitely got a bone to pick with me. After the conversation died down, I left through the back entrance. Agent Osborne had pointed out to me, and I went back home. It was very strange, going from a world of mystical, otherworldly creatures to one where the biggest worry was filing your paperwork on time. I didn't have much time to appreciate it though, as I was only three days away 
from an event that might potentially end my life. I have a lot to think about and a lot of sleep to catch up on, so I'm going to rest for a while. February 20th. The days have flown by since my last visit to the Golden Tooth. As much as I wished they'd slow, work has been a welcome distraction. But these hours at home alone, I haven't dared to go back to the bar. I don't know why, but it feels like I had just turned in my one get in to the bar free card. And if I wanted to go in again, I have to survive South Dakota. Not much is happening, but I'm guessing I'm going to receive the details about the job sometime later today, since we're leaving tomorrow. Sure enough, about five minutes ago, there was a knock at the door, and when I opened it, a manila folder with some papers, clippings, and photographs was there, unattended on the floor. It seemed like it was a habit for these people to do that, disappearing after knocking, but I picked up the folder, and I'm currently going through it to see what I can get from it. The first five things were all about wild animal attacks that happened in the forest in South Dakota on the banks of the White River. Most of the newspapers claimed that the actual pictures of the victims couldn't be shown as they were too graphic for publication, but photographs were attached to the clippings. They were graphic, alright. They were shredded to bits, all in different manners and methods, but I can tell it was done by the same thing. I won't go into detail, but yeah, it was messed up. The papers all claimed that it was by wild animals, which obviously is just a cover-up, and when I got past the articles, there was an important looking document. At the top, it said in big block letters, the White River Windigo. Apparently, when they were first researching it, they had believed it to be just one Windigo. But someone sent in a team and they were quickly overwhelmed by two full-grown ones. That's when the Outsiders, the name of the group I was temporarily joining, was called in. They had a rough location where the den was which was a densely forested area along the banks of the White River, but not much beyond that. Also enclosed was my plane ticket, which was from a company I'd never heard of before, instructions for the trip, and a packing list. There were some more papers behind it, but I decided they would probably just be reiterating what I'd already read, so I decided to focus on packing. It was mostly things you would normally take on a weekend camping trip. Clothes, tent, flashlight, all the survival gear. The note had also said that weapons and other exotic supplies would be provided by the outsiders, but I've already been told twice it's pretty likely I'm going to die this weekend, so I don't want to take any chances. However, I don't have anything that can be remotely considered a weapon at hand, so tonight I'm going to run down and buy a few things at the local sporting goods store. Probably a multi-tool and a large knife, if you can even get one. I'm not much of an outdoorsy guy. I have some camping supplies for my dad, but I've never tried to buy anything, so I don't know what sort of regulations there are. I think that's it, though. There is not much else I can do other than wait. February 21st. Work felt like it went by in a blink of an eye today. I felt a mixture of apprehension and excitement towards the new experience, despite the warnings I've received. I've never done anything fun or exciting, and even though it was like going from a nerf battle to Afghanistan, I couldn't help but feel alive. Ironic, I know. I walked home after work, adrenaline beginning to course through my body, and when I got to my apartment, I couldn't sit still. I had packed all my bags last night, so I went through everything and checked once more that it was all there. It was supposed to be. It all was. 
I'm just waiting now, since the instruction said to arrive at the airport at 8. I'm a little restless, and I know I probably should be at least a little scared, but I'm guessing that'll kick in soon enough. This is just the most exciting thing I've ever done in, well, my life, probably. I don't think I've even left the state before, and now I'm going halfway across the country with people that would kill me for saying the wrong thing. It's okay. It's pretty scary. Man, I need to get out of my head. I'm going for a walk. I managed to pass the time, and at 7.30, I took my bags downstairs and called a cab. I gave him the directions and now I'm waiting. I think I've settled on sort of a mellow excitement because this is definitely a scary experience, but at the same time, it's novel and intriguing. I wonder what the airport will be like. I don't recall there being anything in the area. Maybe it's hidden, like the bar. This is absolutely crazy. The directions led to this private little airstrip where, at first glance, the only barricade between us and it was a little booth with a bar blocking the road. However, when we pulled up to it, the interior was incredibly high-tech. There was a wall of monitors all showing feeds from cameras set up across the compound, and there was an array of weapons on the back wall. I explained why I was there, and he said the cab driver couldn't go any further. He pointed me towards the hangar at the beginning of the runway, and I could just barely see a few shapes milling around that as I got closer was revealed to be the group. They were busy preparing the plane, which was quite the shock to me. I was expecting some sort of passenger plane, maybe even a private jet, but this was small. I doubt it could hold more than 10 people, so we were all comfortable, but barely so, especially with the gear strewn around about the cabin. Tivia is flying, so her and Zephen are in the cockpit, but the rest of us are just sitting in the cabin. It's been about 20 minutes, and Edward's telling us we should get some sleep. So I'll do that for the rest of the flight. There is not much else to do. I mean, I brought a magazine, but no one else is doing anything, so I don't want to seem like the odd man out. I'll update again when I get the chance. February 22nd. Edward woke us up very early this morning and told us we were about 20 minutes out from the job site. Then he walked over to the back of the plane, pulled down a hanging screen, and a map of Cody Township, South Dakota, appeared. This is our location, he began, his accent seemingly accentuated by the nature of his speech. As I'm sure you've all expected, perhaps Zephen read in the briefing, the reports have mostly come from this forest on the banks of the White River. At that, he pointed to an area about a mile in size, consisting of a dense forest tucked into a bend in the long, windy river. We have obtained access to a cabin within the forest, and that is where we will be staying for the duration of the job. Wait a minute, I interjected. We're staying in the forest where the monsters are. That doesn't seem very safe, does it? Generally speaking, these talks go without interruption. I'd like to keep it that way, Edward said, and I thought better of continuing the discourse. Now, as some of you may know, Wendigos rely heavily on changes in scenery for tracking. They are very perceptive of things like slight imprints in the ground where someone has walked, residue of breath in the air, or especially human waste, which is why it is imperative that you only use one of the bathrooms within the cabin, unless otherwise directed by me and me alone. The first day will be purely reconnaissance. We will be establishing cameras here, here, and here, and here, and sensors every 50 meters and 85 meters perimeter around the cabin. We will then wire every feed into the surveillance room, which has been prepared in the basement of the cabin, and then we will wait. 
Unless they are abnormally hungry, Wendigos tend to hunt at night. So sundown tonight will be when we make our first move if they do not do so. Upon landing, each of you will receive a map of the forest with markings designating the camera and sensor locations along with the cabin and where we believe the den to be. We cannot plan for what will happen tomorrow as it depends entirely upon what happens today. Any questions? He looked directly at me and at that and I shook my head. Excellent. We should be landing shortly. After Edward had briefed us, the group began to talk quietly amongst themselves, and Edward came over to sit next to me. In a low voice, he said, I know you're well aware of this by now, but there is a very good chance you won't come out of this in one piece, and we can't afford to coddle you like a rookie normally would be. The best we can do is try and make sure you're never alone, but even that won't take precedence over getting the job done. Thanks, I guess, I replied, not really sure how to respond. I suppose if I go down out here, it'll at least be more exciting than if Agent Osborne had taken me out behind the shed and put a bullet in me. He raised an eyebrow but didn't say anything. In other words, yes, I've made peace with my maker. I'm pretty sure where I'm headed when the lights go out, I said. Then he told me probably the most disconcerting thing I've heard in my entire life. You have no idea where you're going, trust me, I've been there. Then he stood and walked up to the cockpit without another word. I've been trying to figure out what he meant by it ever since, and to be honest, I don't have a clue. It was only about 15 minutes before we landed, and it was an airstrip similar to the one we'd flown out of. After we landed, a long stretch limousine pulled up in front of us, and a woman stepped out. She wore sunglasses despite the early hour, and she introduced herself as our employer. She said that, while it is unusual for employers to introduce themselves personally to the employees in this business, this was an unusual scenario. I'm not sure if she was talking about me or something I don't know about yet. But this past hour has been a whirlwind. On top of the hurricane the past week has been, and I'm barely staying afloat. After she exchanged some words with Edward, she turned back to us and said we'd be leaving momentarily. I figured we'd take the limo, but after she introduced herself, she led us to an old beat-up sedan, and Edward told us that was our vehicle. Now everyone else is talking about the job. I've heard a few bets going around on who would get killed first, and there was even an over-under on how many of us would make it out. But I had the same uneasy feeling I had earlier. I sat in the back quietly, which seemed to throw off the big European guy. I forgot his name. He looked at me funny for a while, then he began to look around, simply observing things. He's very scary, to be honest. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's reading this over my shoulder as I'm writing, too. We are at the edge of the woods right now. It's around 9 in the morning, and Edward's going through all our stuff one last time to make sure we all brought everything. He says, once we go in, we're not coming back out until the job is done, so we'd better have everything we needed. I know I do, and I'm pretty sure these guys do as well, so there shouldn't be any problems. The difference between the forest and the outside is like night and day. The trees are packed together incredibly tightly, even encroaching on the small dirt road at times and they block out almost all sun, except for when it filters through the leaves, spraying tiny rays of light down upon us on occasion. It wasn't a gradual shift either. It was like we entered the forest, someone had turned a switch. The mood once again changed as well. We were quiet now, on edge. Every blade of grass, every leaf, every branch seemed like it was being taken in by these outsiders. The big guy next to me keeps looking over at me, though. He's freaking me out. 
It was only a 10 minute drive from the edge of the forest to our cabin, but it felt a lot longer. Something about this place seems off. It doesn't feel like a normal forest. Something I can put my finger on is that there's no sound. No birds are chirping. No sticks are breaking under the feet of animals. There's just the occasional sound of leaves rustling with the breeze, and the methodical sounds of the group unpacking inside. I should probably go get my stuff ready. I just wanted to get acclimated to the forest. It's around noon now, so we'll probably have some food, then get out to start setting up the sensors for tonight. It's about four now, and we're working on setting up the surveillance. I got paired off with Tavia Stewart, the one that flew the plane, and she's, well, more normal than everyone else, I suppose. It was after lunch when Edward told us the assignments, and when we were prepared, she came over to me. Looks like I got the rookie, she said, slightly raising her eyebrow. I was initially nervous that she was annoyed or even resentful that she obtained the added burden of someone with no experience, but she then laughed and the tension quickly dissipated. Don't worry, as long as everything goes according to plan and you follow instructions, it'll all be fine. I can deal with following instructions, I replied, but what happens if something doesn't go according to plan? She sighed for a moment. You're getting down to it, aren't you? If something goes wrong, we improvise, which is why if that happens, you'll be in a spot of trouble because you have nothing with which to base your improvisations off of. Let's hope everything goes to plan then, I said, a dark mood settling in once more. Quickly, she nodded her head in the direction we'd been assigned. Come on, we better get going. I followed along, and we struck up conversation. It was a pleasing reprieve from the oddness of the rest of the trip. When we spoke, it almost seemed like it was just a walk in the forest, and that, combined with the density of trees providing a challenge to navigate, provided ample distraction from the horrors that lay within it. But then we arrived at our first location. When we got there, she removed her pack and set it on the ground. It was like a crash landing to reality. When she extracted the sensor and began inputting some perimeter information into the keypad. As she was affixing it to a tree, suddenly a loud, sharp screech sounded from somewhere behind us, causing me to jump. Was that one of them? I asked, suddenly on high alert. Sure sounded like it, she replied. I mean, a lot of cryptids have that call, but it makes the most sense that it was a Wendigo, considering we're here to hunt them. I thought they were only awake at night. What are they doing up now? I asked. They only hunt at night, she corrected. They tend not to sleep a lot. It just keeps getting worse. I looked around, taking in our location and especially making note of where the sound had come from. I judged it to be around a few hundred feet in the direction the sensor was facing, so I assumed it to be the den, or at least a commonly traveled spot by these creatures. You ready to go? Tiva asked as she hoisted the pack once more. That's it. This is a quick task. Yeah, I mumbled, not paying her much attention. I was in survival mode. It was as if the call had awakened something primal in me. Something left over from when we were bashing rocks together to make weapons. I've taken the time while Tavi's setting up the second sensor to write this, and I'm beginning to feel strange. This primal fear has heightened my senses and flooded me with a sense of invincibility, almost to the point where I anticipate the moment the creatures make their attack. It's an enjoyable feeling, if I were to be honest, and one that is entirely new to me. I noticed everything. My reflexes are at their peak. The anticipation will likely fade by tonight, but I believe that I am ready. As we walked from the fourth to the final sensor, we came across a well-trodden path. The road we came in on was the only path marked 
on the map. So I'm not sure where this one came from, but I have an idea. There were hoof prints packing down the dirt, along with other sets of prints I didn't recognize. So it could be a hunting path used by the creatures. The hoof prints could be something they hunt, and I assume the creatures themselves have made the ones I don't recognize. We're almost done now, Tavia just finished setting up the last sensor, and we're going to begin the walk home soon. The sun's beginning to set as well, so it's nearly perfect timing. When we were just about at the cabin, there was another screech. It sounded like it was from the same area as the last one, but it sounded different. Not the screech itself, it was certainly from the same creature, but the way it was delivered. It seemed angry, provoked even. Tivia and I met back up with the rest of the group in front of the cabin, and in some sort of odd final to the wide array of emotions I'd seen throughout this trip, everyone had their own. Edward was anticipating the hunt. Tivia was in a contemplative mood, presumably thinking of the possible outcomes. Frida was checking all of her weapons yet again. Lorenz, as I finally learned the large European's name, was standing silently, glaring at everything he looked at. And Zephin seemed to not know a mission was about to happen, as he threw a small stone in the general direction of an upstairs window until Edward told him to stop. I'm pretty sure he still doesn't like me, and I'm still not sure why. I'll have to give it more thought later though, as it's getting quite dark out now and Edwards just told me to go inside. Alright, it's 8 o'clock now, and it looks like it's going to be quite the boring night. The others have been going out on patrols sporadically, but they haven't run into any creatures. Since Edward claims he can't afford to have me wasting his time, he's put me in charge of watching the sensors and monitors and there has been absolutely nothing. It's been about two hours of this now, and boredom honestly poses the greatest danger to me as is. Nine o'clock now and still nothing. Ten o'clock is come and gone, and we have yet to encounter anything mildly spooky. It's 10.22 now. Lorenz just radioed in that he spotted one of them in his scope. And minutes later, I had three readings on my sensors. I told Edward about it, and he quickly went to Rose, Zephin, and Tivia, who had been sleeping during Lorenz and Frida's shift. On their way out, he told me they'd take care of the creatures, then they'd be right back, and to watch them on the monitors if I got worried. I'm not terribly worried about them. They probably know what they're doing, but... Three readings on the sensors. Lorenz wasn't patrolling within the range of the sensors. There were four creatures out there, and we'd only accounted for three. Now these aren't just heat sensors or something that can be tripped by anything with a beating heart. Edwards explained that they were established to track some sort of energy native to these creatures. If there's three blips on the radar, it's safe to assume that there's three things with the capability of doing some very bad things out there. To be honest, one more than expected probably isn't the worst thing in the world. But if there's four, why not five? Why not fifteen? Why not an army? They could be walking straight into a death trap. I have to do something. February 22nd. In hindsight, the group having left me without a radio may not have been the greatest bit of planning we've seen so far. Now the only way for me to warn them is if I were to go out there into the pitch black, demon-filled forest and tell them myself. And that just might be what I'll do in a few minutes. That fear, I keep saying, is eventually going to set in. Yeah, it's here. What am I doing out here? I'm in South Dakota. I have work on Monday. 
This time last week, I was okay. This time last week, I was under the impression I was being wiretapped. So maybe that's not the best example. But still, death. Those screeches I heard during the day are happening what feels like every five minutes now. To make matters worse, the one camera we have that's showing right outside the cabin just went out. And I'm pretty sure that right before it did, I saw something blue and hazy approaching the lens. That's when I realized something. I was alone. There was no one that was coming to help me. In fact, if I die here, no one may ever find my body. I don't know why that came to mind, but it's the thought that echoed throughout my mind as I paced back and forth in the surveillance room. I was beginning to form a plan. There was something outside I didn't know what, and there were things deeper in the force that I believed I knew something about. The Windigos could be killed with regular weapons, but if they were other creatures out there, there's no telling how I could deal with them. The only way I could find out was by warning the others, and the time for that may be running out. I made up my mind if I was going out there, and I'd either reach the others or die trying. They had left me a pistol, and I walked over to the table where I had left it and picked it up. I never fired a gun before, not even in preparation for the mission. But if I was ever going to do it, this was as good as a time as any to get started. I quickly ran to the back wall where the leftover supplies were, and I strapped a holster around my waist and jammed the pistol in. Then I quietly climbed up the stairs and entered the dark main floor of the cabin. As I slipped out of the basement door, sliding in close behind me, I tried in vain to slow my heart rate, but my breath only quickened as I crept through the darkened room to the front door. I had my hand on the knob and was about to turn it when the temperature of the metal began to drop. I quickly let go, fearing my warm hands would stick to it, and then paused. I slowly knelt down and peered through the keyhole to see what the hell I murmured. Looking closer, it was the same hazy blue mist that I glimpsed before the camera went out, and it was hovering outside the door. It was about four feet of it, hovering a foot above the ground and glowing a dull blue light with an odd calmness. There was a moment where nothing happened. It stayed still, simply existing. Maybe, I thought to myself, there was nothing to fear. Maybe it's a friendly creature here to help me. I stood, clearing my throat to attempt to make contact with it. But then, in a great rush of blue light, the mist poured through the keyhole, making a beeline for my chest. I was standing too close to the door. I had no time to react. It rushed out of the keyhole and into my body. As soon as the first tendril of fog touched my chest, an icy chill spread throughout my body. I panicked, and all the stealth went out the window, and I frantically backed up into a wall as the intensity of the freezing cold grew. The thing was inside me. I couldn't fight back, but it certainly wasn't for the lack of trying. I slammed myself into the wall again and again, knocking over a small table with a vase in my attempt to purge the fog from me. But slowly, my vision began to dim, and my body temperature plummeted. I had no way of knowing how to get this thing out of my system, but I knew I had to try, an idea forming in my head. I ran haphazardly through the house, searching for my target, then I found it a light bulb. It was getting hard to move by this point. The cold seemed to be taking over my body, locking up my system. But with the last reserve of my strength, I smashed the glass bulb, grasping the metal prongs and flipping on the switch. The zap 
I awoke with a start minutes later to the sound of gunshots coming from deep in the forest. It took me a while to get my bearings, but slowly it all came back to me. The blue mist, the chilling cold, and the light bulb, and others. The others, I exclaimed into the empty and now dark house. The shock must have shortened a fuse, as now every light in the house was out. That didn't matter, though, as the rest of the group was certainly in mortal peril now. I leapt to my feet and sprang to the door. Before I left, I carefully checked for any signs of glowing blue cloud, but it seemed as if the shock had either killed it or at least given it enough of a fright to send it back off for some time. I checked the pistol one last time, took a deep breath and opened the door, stepping out into pitch black night. The forest was still, but it certainly wasn't calm. Other than the occasional pops of gunfire, it was deathly silent, on edge, even. I didn't want to run, justifying it with the fact that if I were to trip over an unseen branch, that would prevent anybody from getting help. But it was more to allow me to make less noise, in theory attracting less attention. But all it did was delay the inevitable, for before long, the sound of gunshots grew louder and I was there. It was the most chaotic scene I'd observed to that point. From where I was crouched in the bushes, I could see Frida springing from my left to right, glancing frantically over her shoulder, Edward facing opposite me, operating some gadget I didn't recognize. Lawrence hanging out of a tree with one hand, his sniper on the ground, a slim crack running down the barrel, Tibia taking cover behind a tree, shouting into a walkie-talkie, and Zephin was nowhere to be found. However, one thing I couldn't see was whatever they were fighting. I hadn't bothered to check the sensors before I left, due to both my hurriedness and the assumption that my shock had knocked out the power, so I hadn't had a clue where any of them could be, the fog or the windigos. So I stepped out from the bushes, waving my arms, guys, guys, there's a problem, I shouted over the gunfire, something else is out here, it's not just windigos. What are you talking about, Edwards asked, sprinting over to me when he found me in the darkness. What are you thinking, leaving the cabin? It's incredibly dangerous out here. Listen, it's not just Windigos out here, there's something else, I told him frantically. There's this glowing blue fog outside of the cabin, and I'd seen an extra entity on the radar. So when I ran out of the house to try and warn you it, glowing blue fog, that's not good, that's not good at all, he interrupted, running a hand through his hair. Then he took out his radio and spoke into it. Zephin, get back here now. There was no response. Zephin, get back to the Area 3, he repeated, but there was nothing. Where is he, I asked. We sent him to the den, and two adults are here with us. He would have been able to take one child alone, he replied. You were going to kill a child, I asked. Doesn't that seem a little immoral to you? We don't get paid to be moral, Edward told me. Now if there are Vendera Nook here, I'm going to need some equipment from the cabin. Find Zeph and give him any aid he requires, and survive until I get back. I nodded and he sprang off towards the cabin. I turned back to the freight, and as soon as I did, I saw a hulking figure emerge from the forest. Standing nearly seven feet tall, the windigo completely blew away my expectations. It added about a foot to that total with its jagged antlers that protruded from the skull of what looked to be a buck. Its chest and back were covered in fur, and its legs stretched down into hooves. Sharp claws gleamed in the moonlight at the end of its long arms and it paused for a moment before leaping into the air, slicing Tora's rifle in two like a hot knife through butter. As it looked up at the man who was still struggling to regain his footing on the branch, it let out an unearthly howl, different still from the other two I'd heard. 
It was about to pounce when suddenly a flash of movement caught its eye. Frida's gun had jammed, so she tossed it aside and pulled out her sidearm, preparing to fire on it. However, before she could, it leaped with astonishing speed towards her, having the distance between them in a single jump. I fumbled with my hip holster, drawing my gun and shaking hands as she tried in vain to shoot the quick-footed creature. I lined up the sights, but there was no time to hone it in for sure. So I had pulled the trigger. Crack! It was much louder in my hands than it had been listening from the cabin. It startled me so much that I reflexively dropped the pistol. But when I regained my bearings, it seemed like I had hit my mark. The Windigo lay on its side on the ground, mere feet away from Frida, who was now waving at me. As my hearing returned and the ringing in my ears died down, I began to hear her saying, Go, go, find Zephin, we'll hold them off. I nodded, gingerly picking up the pistol and ran off into the woods. I was making my way towards the path Tivia and I had found earlier that day, knowing that I had to lead to the den where Zephin was most likely going through what I had been through when the fog had entered my body. Running on pure adrenaline, I covered the ground in record time, arriving at the mouth of the cave jutting out of the grassy ground. I couldn't see more than a foot into it, and before I went in, I ran over to where we had placed the sensor earlier that day and tore it out of the ground. As I made my way back to the cave, I stripped it apart until I found a small batteries, then ripped them out of their compartment. They were smaller than I'd expected, but they just might do the trick. Once inside the cave, I slowed my pace, fearing a rock outcropping or a sudden drop in ceiling. But luckily, moments after entering, I heard a weak cough. Zephin, I exclaimed, searching for the source of the noise. Where are you? Another cough was my only response, but it was closer, and I was able to locate him. I knelt down by the side of the dark figure and felt his arm. It was ice cold, fearing that I might already be too late. I pried open his mouth and touched the batteries to his tongue. Instantly, his body began to convulse, and I nearly lost control of one of the circular batteries. But I managed to grab a hold of it and pull it out of his mouth. Then two things happened simultaneously. Zephin sat bolted right up with a shout, sending me scrambling backwards. I'm lucky. I had the reaction because the second thing was a cloud of blue fog rushing out of his chest like a gust of wind, zipping past where I'd been moments ago and hitting the wall, causing it to spread out like a puff of smoke. Zephin, conscious now once more, was incredibly confused. He glanced quickly around the cave, saying, What? What's going on? Where am I? God, it's cold in here. Zephin, it's me, I panted climbing to my feet, my energy all but depleted. Come on, it's not safe here. I don't know. I rather like the interior design. I think we should stay, he replied sarcastically. Give me a hand, Sherlock. I can't feel my legs. What did you do to me? I haven't been this sore since the sexy bumblebee at the 92 San Diego State Halloween party turned out to be a dating martial fluke. I passed for a moment in utter confusion, then decided it was better for the both of us to let the details of that story remain in the past. I'm glad to see the shock didn't diminish your bright and cheery personality. You were being killed by, well, that. I gestured to the glowing blue cloud as I knelt down to help him up, so I zapped you back to reality with a few batteries. Batteries, he exclaimed. You didn't take them out of the sensor, did you? Yes, why, I asked. Those aren't normal batteries, Christ. They're specially made to power the sensors, he said, smacking his forehead with his free hand. You could have killed me were I not so naturally resistant to electric shocks. You are not naturally resistant to electric shocks, I said, rolling my eyes. Come on, let's... I cut off the sentence as the shadow crossed in front of the moonlight 
at the cave's entrance. We stopped walking and stood silently. I held my breath as my blood suddenly ran colder than Zeppin's had been five minutes ago. We were about 15 feet from the entrance, but we could clearly make out the figure of a Wendigo creeping closer towards us, distinctly outlined by the light of the moon. Saliva glistened on its teeth as it paused for a moment at the mouth of the cave. For that moment, it was silent. Then it let out a terrifyingly loud shriek, rearing its head back to look at the moon and charging forward at us. I thought you killed this thing, I shouted, scooping Zephyr into my arms and running back into the cave. I was sort of busy, you know, dying, he reminded me. I rolled my eyes, sprinting as fast as I could. The creature seemed to have stopped its pursuit, but I didn't want to give it a chance to catch back up. However, I couldn't keep the pace up for long. I was already exhausted, and the short burst of energy from the pure terror of seeing the creature quickly wore off. I was now losing focus, getting sloppy, and it wasn't long before my ankle slammed into an unseen rock, and I was sent sprawling to the ground, Zeppin smacking into the wall just in front of me, groaning. I quickly flipped over to my back to see if the Windigo had caught up, but it had, but it hadn't been chasing me. It emerged from a side passageway, and behind it, the mist I'd stunned with the batteries followed, producing its unearthly glow with what I took as an aurora of mockery. Son of a, I muttered but I was too tired to offer any resistance other than feebly crawl back on my elbows. It did nothing to slow the approach of the hideous Windigo. Maybe it was the dim light casted by the mist. Maybe it was my level of exhaustion. But I could have sworn I saw the corners of the Windigo's jaded mouth turn up as he reared back to slice my body apart, ending me just like it had so many others. I closed my eyes, preparing for the blow, and then it came. Bang! It was strange. I didn't feel any pain as the claws tore through me. I felt them hit me. I heard a ringing in my ears, and I saw the a frame light at the end of the tunnel, but the pain never... You idiot, that makes twice tonight you've almost got me killed, Zephyr shouted from the end of the cave. You're buying extra time. We're at the tooth. What? I groaned, still staring into the light. What happened? Then the light drew near, and it spoke in a familiar British accent. Blimey, you damn near got yourself and Zephyr killed. You're lucky we got here in time, otherwise you'd be dinner. I saw then that it was Edward carrying a flashlight and a gun. I sighed, closing my eyes, and rolled the dead Windigo off me. As I slowly regained my senses, I made out Tibia in the background. She was holding what looked to be a vacuum cleaner, and she was switching it off. When she saw me looking at her, she rolled her eyes. What did you do with the sensor? I put a lot of work into that. I explained, and she gasped. And you didn't kill him. How? I'm naturally shock resistant, Zephin butted in. I don't want to get into that. Why are you holding a vacuum cleaner? I said hastily, changing the subject before Zephin could. Well, I don't really know where that would lead, but probably not somewhere I want to go. Edward actually rigged this up. She said, gesturing to him, We have equipment specifically for dealing with Vendanook, but we didn't think we'd need them, as we had no reason to, so I had to improvise, he said, since the equipment's basically just a high-powered vacuum cleaner. That's what I made. I fiddled around with the wirings using some very technical electric terms, but to simplify, I hooked it up to a car battery and adjusted the current so that it would, as Americans say, empty the tank. As I was trying to focus on what he was saying, the last reserves of my energy finally gave out, and I laid my head down on the rock. I don't suppose there's any chance anyone's going to carry me back. Edward nodded at Lawrence and said, Lawrence, will you take you two back? Rest up, you've earned it. We'll take care of the rest of them. I finally let my fatigue take over. 
and I was washed away into the tides of sleep. The next thing I remember, I was on the couch in the cabin. February 23rd. I didn't wake up until noon on Sunday, and when I did, Tibia was there to explain everything to me. She said that the job had been going fine until one of the Windigos managed to sneak up on Lawrence. Lawrence reacted quickly enough to avoid a deadly blow, but it had knocked him off balance and he had nearly fallen out of the tree. Then, at the worst possible moment, the second adult had attacked. They believe now that the Vendanook, the name of the Blue Mist, were responsible for the organization and circlements. Once Tivia had cleared everything up, the others came and told me that it was time to go. It all happened in such a rush. The explanation, the car ride, and before I knew it, the most wild 24 hours of my life was over. The plane ride back, like the first, was mostly silent until the end, when Edward came over to sit next to me. I had just woke up. As I was still incredibly emotionally taxed, and he sat in silence for a few seconds before beginning. You... you surprised us all, all jokes aside. This was an extremely dangerous mission, and not only did you survive, but your participation was integral to our success, he said. Zephin, though he may or may not show it, is grateful to you. He tells me you saved his life directly twice, though you may or may not have put it in danger twice as well. But without your bravery, your quick wittedness, your intuition, we may have died, and for that we are all thankful. I was caught off guard by the in-depth compliment. I thank you, I guess. I was also expecting to die. I really didn't think it was going to end up like that. He nodded. Well, I suppose you've earned a ticket into this strange, strange world. You are free to do whatever you want, except, of course, reveal any of this outside of the gold tooth. But now you can walk away a free man. You've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with unholy forces, and you came out the other side in one piece. You can walk away right now, forget all about this, and live your life. But I have a feeling you won't. You've tasted this side of the world, and you're ready to ride it to the end of the rabbit hole, aren't you? I didn't respond for a moment, then I said, I need some time to think about it. He nodded. He knew as well as I did that he was right, so he didn't push the matter. I once again reiterate our gratefulness, he said, standing up. There will be a cab waiting at the airport to bring you home. I'll see you again soon, my friend. Those were the last words any of them spoke to me. And they're bouncing around my head as I sit in the cab, watching the flashing lights of the city pass my window. The city that once felt vibrant and full of life now seemed dull, lifeless, and pointless. I thought back to the thrill I had felt, the sense of invincibility, even the moment I thought I'd die. It was unlike anything I'd ever felt, and, well, I want more. Hey guys, thank you for listening to today's Creepypasta, and I hope you enjoyed. I do have a podcast called The Murder House Radio Show. Check it out. The link will be in the description below. It is a true crime podcast. But if you did like, like, comment, subscribe, and share for more, hit the bell notification when you subscribe and select all to get all notifications whenever I upload. I upload six days a week, Monday to Saturday, at least one video a day. Now all the long episodes and full series of creepypastas are on all the major podcasting platforms under the name deadly underscore zone underscore narrations there will be a link in the description also go follow all the social media accounts they are in the description below i do have a subreddit called deadly narrations the link will be in the description also in the description below are the sources to the creepypasta and the music used so go check those out let me know what creepypasta you would like to hear next, or if you have your own creepypasta you would like me to narrate, or if you have a creepypasta series you would like to hear, send them to me on any of the social medias in the DMs, or to my email address which is also in the description, or leave them in the comments below. Also in the description below 
is the author's social medias if they have any listed. But that's it for today's creepy pasta. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time in the deadly zone, stay deadly and stay spooky.